Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for momentum. I thank you, God, for the word that you have given us today. I thank you for the service that we've already been a part of. I thank you for the worship that you deserve, God, that we in unity got to express our hearts of gratitude to you this morning already and that you inhabit the praises of your people. I I know right now that you are here with us in this room. You fill this place with your glory and your presence. And what is glory but your manifested presence? You're here with us. We've gathered in your name and you're here with us. And so as I speak this word that you have given me to this, your beloved family, God, I ask you, let them see you and not me. Let them hear by the spirit exactly what they need to hear. Let the word pierce exactly where it needs to pierce in our lives. We've been praying that we would be purified, God that you would purify our hearts. And I thank you that this morning you're planting the seed of the word to see that come to pass in our lives. And as we hear, we have open ears that you are letting the scales fall from our eyes and you're giving us wise and understanding hearts to receive your word with joy and to allow you, Holy Spirit, to work within us. In Jesus' name we pray, Lord. Amen. Amen. All right. Now, we are going to be in Matthew 9, 9 through 13. Um, I've got a message for you. And probably have three messages for you. But on this Wednesday night, I'm going to be going into the the rest of this message. So if you... If I don't get to it today, I'm going to be speaking into it on Wednesday night for a little bit before we go to our, our bash and have fun together. And it's, I understand the times that we live in. And I know that the word that you need to hear is what he has for you this morning. So Matthew 9, verse 9 through 13, it says, As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, follow me. So he rose and followed him. Now it happened as Jesus sat at the table in the house that behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. Where did Jesus go after he called Matthew? He went to Matthew's house. Who came to Matthew's house when Jesus went to Matthew's house? Everybody who knew Matthew. Sounds like it was tax collectors and sinners. Tax collectors at that time were not viewed favorably. Any of you who've watched The Chosen understand what that meant. They were collaborating with the occupying army of Rome at that time. So it was viewed that they were going against their religion to do that, against their fellow Jews. So Matthew was not esteemed by his own people. And then Jesus comes and he calls him. As far as the Pharisees were concerned, that's like strike one against Jesus. Why would you even call a tax collector, let alone go to his house And then you sit down at his table, and not just him, but you let a bunch of other tax collectors and sinners come in and sit down with y'all? Pharisees were speaking Texan. (laughs) And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Hmm. When Jesus heard that, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Okay, so let's kind of break down what Jesus was doing and who he's talking to, because You know, there's a lot of times where you can come to a service like this and the person up here holding the microphone will say things 
And you'll go, okay, well, that makes some sense, but what's a Pharisee? Well, what is Jesus saying here? Because Jesus is actually quoting another scripture when he tells them this. What Jesus is quoting is Hosea 6.6, 6, which says, For I desire mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. So he's speaking the word to the Pharisees. Now, who are the Pharisees at this time? You have to understand, Pharisees during this time that Jesus was alive, there was something called a Sanhedrin. Sanhedrin was the court of Israel. It's not the court of Rome, it's the court of the Jewish people. The great Sanhedrin was in Jerusalem. There were 70 members plus one. The reason why that number mattered was because in the time of Moses, when Moses was too overworked to adjudicate the things that were going on among the tribes of Israel, he was so busy that he couldn't be the judge over them specifically as they went forward through the wilderness to the promised land. So the day came where the word was spoken to him, hey, you're going to have to delegate this. So in that time, the Lord gave them the plan, which it was 70 judges plus Moses. That was the, ended up becoming the great Sanhedrin who would be in Jerusalem overseeing the word of God as it pertained to the Jewish people who were living according to the law of God. With me so far? Wonderful. Now, in Israel... Every town had a smaller, which was called a lesser Sanhedrin. It's like the municipal courts. Those are overseen by the same people. These are the Pharisees, and they were seeing to the things that were going on in the town. There are smaller groups of them, but they still viewed themselves, and they were viewed by the people as the ones who judged the law. So if a person got into trouble, it wasn't that they got into trouble just with Rome and Roman law. They got into trouble with Jewish law. If they're violating the Sabbath, if they're doing things that they shouldn't do according to the word of God. And so you could see where the, the Pharisees were the people on earth at that time who represented what was right and what was wrong with the word of God. They were the ones making judgment on what was and what wasn't right according to the word of God. Problem. The word became flesh and dwelt among them. Jesus, the Messiah, came. From the time that the Bible began to be written until Malachi. All the Old Testament, all the prophets, are, this is for this purpose. The Old Testament is a type and shadow of what was to come. The new covenant in Christ Jesus, the Messiah. But the Messiah comes and the people who represented the word of God on earth didn't recognize him. That's a problem. The word became flesh, and the people who were judging the word for the people couldn't recognize the word when they saw it in their face. That's trouble. So Hosea 6, that Jesus is speaking to them, was a call to repentance. It's, a, it's basically saying to Israel at that time, your sin has called you suffering, but if you return to me, I'll restore you. And it, it, if you get deeper into what it says in Hosea 2 through 3, it talks about he will revive, he'll raise up, that we may live in his sight. He'll let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord because his going forth is established as the morning. He will come to us like the rain. The latter and the former rain. He's basically the Lord in that in Hosea 6, not just calling them to repentance. Yes, if you read the whole Old Testament, you come into this understanding that what God was attempting to do with his people was have relationship. But his people kept choosing 
lesser things. They would choose to worship lesser th- gods that couldn't save them, gods that hadn't delivered them from, e- from Egypt, God that hasn't brought them to the promised land. Cloud by day and a fire by night, but they still got away from him. And so God is calling to repentance. And so Jesus is quoting Hosea when he says, go and learn this. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. So why was he telling the Pharisees this? Because Jesus came to save, he's called to the lost sheep. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that we wouldn't perish but have eternal life. And the Pharisees who represent God looked at the the tax collectors and the sinners and had no compassion and no mercy for them at all. It wasn't, praise God, that someone has come to minister to those who are in sin. It's how dare you be seen with those who are in sin because we're holy. They're telling the word of God that he's doing it wrong. And the word of God speaks back to those who should know better and tells them, you need to go and learn mercy. Because I desire it more than sacrifice. Meaning, all these rules that you're following, that you are making other people follow without the spirit of the law, has not brought you closer to me because you can't see me when I come. And who did he spend Jesus in the Gospels? He's always in a fight with the Pharisees. It ought not be, but that was what happened. Because they had gotten so far from the truth. And I've quoted John 1, and I'm going to continue to quote it, but I'll tell you where to find it so you can look it up for yourself. John 1, 14 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So the truth became apparent in the body of Jesus, our Messiah. And when they were confronted with the truth, they rebuked it. That is the wrong place to be. A Dustyism from the old days was, Pastor Dusty used to say, if God be for you, who can be against you? If God's against you, quit. Because why are you still fighting and he's against you? So the truth became apparent and what did the truth reveal? Well, the truth revealed how far their hearts were from God. How different their attitudes were compared to the word they were defending. So, I know you're glad I'm talking about the Pharisees, right? Hello, nice to meet you this morning. Are you a Christian? You don't have to answer out loud, but you have to answer. You and God need to have this conversation. So, are you a Christian? Do you know Jesus? Have you made Jesus Lord of your life? Are you a follower of Christ? Now, you may be saying, well, pastor, those all say the same thing. And I would say, no, they, they don't say the same thing. They're actually 
defining some levels within our relationship with God. So, when I ask you if you're a Christian, there are two billion professing Christians on earth. It's a big number. Actually, the largest single religion. Now, in, within that religion, it's divided into a number of denominations and churches and all those different things, not to get into that, but professing Christians, about two billion on earth. If two billion people on earth, which were professing Jesus as their, they're saying they're Christians, if they were living the Christian life, what would the earth look like? I think that there'd be some evidence of the love of God made manifest. Now, there's evidence of the love made God made manifest here in our, in our loving the people who he's called us to be neighbors with and our loving each other. But... Twelve disciples that became apostles affected the world. Two billion people professing to be Christians. And the tug of war is still looking pretty heavy right now. Right? So that means that some of the people who are professing to be Christians are not actually living a life as a Christian. So the, the Pharisees were convinced that they were right and I don't know where I heard this but I've heard it and so now you're going to hear it they were sincerely wrong you know a lot of stuff we get into is right and wrong but the issue that you get into the reason that you're having the argument is because the person that, that is wrong is sincerely wrong they believe it to the depth of their soul that they're standing where they need to be standing saying what they need to be saying where did they go off where did it get wrong and these are the questions that we have to address in our lives as we are called to be his church and so when I say are you a Christian you say yes well what does that mean to you as a Christian what does it mean concerning what you're going to say and what you're going to do and how you're going to live your life so as a Christian 2 Timothy 3 16 and 17 says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine for reproof for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Notice that first part. You can go back to it. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Do you know the literal translation of that is God breathed? So Christianity 101 are you a Christian? Do you believe the word of God? Do you believe that God breathed these scriptures through the people who wrote them down by the power of the Holy Spirit? You need to come to a decision on this one because it matters for the rest of your life because if you don't believe that he breathed the scriptures by the power of his Holy Spirit, then they don't have the authority to tell you how to live. Billy Graham, famous evangelist. Pretty much everybody in America has heard of Billy Graham. Billy Graham, when he was in Bible school, there was a huge debate raging in Christianity at that point years ago, decades ago, about whether the Bible was divinely inspired, whether God had spoken these words to us, whether that scripture that it says in Timothy is true or not. 
And so he is a minister and he's in Bible school. He has to, am I going to be a minister that believes that the scriptures are breathed by God? Or am I going to be a minister that believes that the Bible is a book of philosophy and has, is suggesting how people should live according to the time and culture in which it was written? Now, I can tell you by the ministry of Billy Graham how he decided. But one day, he went into the woods, and he spent a day wrestling with God. And what he came down to was, I have to believe by faith that God spoke these words to us by the Spirit. Same for you. Same for me. I have to believe by faith that the word is true. And that it's just like Paul's telling Timothy, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and thoroughly equipped for every good work. Do you know Jesus? John 17 says, this is eternal life that you may that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Have you made Jesus Lord of your life? Romans 9, 10 says, if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Are you a follower of Christ? Matthew 16, 24 in the Amplified says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wishes to follow me as my disciple, he must deny himself, set aside selfish interests, take up his cross, expressing a willingness to endure whatever may come, and follow me, believing in me, conforming to my example in living, and if need be, suffering or perhaps dying because of faith in me. So you see there's a big difference between, oh, yeah, I'm a Christian, and being a fully committed follower of Christ. In this life that we live, in the world that we live, the time has come where you need to address these things within you. What do I believe? Am I a Christian? Yes. What does that mean for my life? Does that mean that that I'm going to glorify God with my life by doing what he says, by keeping his commandments? Now see, Jesus, when he said, go forth and make disciples, notice that. There's a difference between somebody being converted to believe and being a disciple who is able to make disciples. Because the disciples are the ones who are fully committed to the process of becoming more like him. They're being drawn nearer to him on a daily basis. You're in a growing relationship with God. That's what a healthy, a healthy relationship with Jesus is growing day by day. And the dangerous thing that you get into is that there are that this blanket of Christianity is thrown over all of us. And I, I told you all the story that I, I, I got the chance to go to the, that conference that was the people who had survived genocide in Rwanda. I'm not going to go into the details of that, but I, I just want to point one thing out to you. At the time of that genocide, 95% of that country professed Jesus Christ. It was 95% Christian country. The issue that they got into, now that was in 100 days, a million people died. Christian at the hands of Christian. How could this be? Because they put their tribal affiliation ahead of their affiliation with God. What is it that we believe? We need to know. This, you know, I, I'll tell you, I'm closing with this, and I, 
Mary will, Mary will finally understand why I've been watching what I've been watching. I was like, this morning, the Lord revealed it to me. I've watched a bunch of shows about gold mining. I never cared about it in my life. Yeah, I, you know, I look for stuff. If I'm going to watch something, it's going to be something that isn't profaning. It's not, you know. Here's what I learned. They buy this big, expensive machine. The job of that machine is to separate the mud, the rocks, and the dirt, and the clay from what is precious. And most of the dirt isn't valuable at all. It just has to be removed. It's just called overburden, and it's just dirt on top of what matters where the gold is. And it has to just be removed from the beginning. But then the process has to start of getting the ground that bears gold from mud to the gold being separated so that you can identify it. And as I was sitting there this morning, I thought, this is literally what our life in Christ is doing by the, by the power of the Spirit and the Word. So the first thing, they take this bucket of dirt that you couldn't see gold in unless you had a microscope. And they dump it. And the first thing that happens when they dump it, it hits this place where they're pouring in has bars to protect the rocks. That kicks the rocks out so that they don't go into the process and destroy the machine. Sin is what those rocks are. They will destroy the process. They don't, them coming into the machine is not going to be any benefit. That's why you need to know if you believe the word of God or not. Because sin is always going to be sin. It's not going to become less than sin. It's not going to change based on the culture in which you live. It's not going to become easier to say, yeah, that one's fine. No, God, you know, God's been rolling the dial down on that volume over the last 2,000 years, and he doesn't care as much about that one as he used to. There is nothing in the Word of God that says that. He established immorality is immorality. Sexual immorality is still a sin. You know that that covers an entire group of actions, and everybody wishes that I would only talk about everybody else's action. Talk about sexual immorality, people in the church say, let's put it all off on gay. Because that might not come near to adultery or fornication. But adultery and fornication are as much sexual immorality as homosexuality, the practice of homosexuality. So let's be straight about it. What is, what is it that you believe? What does your Bible say about immorality? Well, it says that sin, the wages of sin is death. How do you make a decision in this world? What does the Bible say? I'm a Christian. I believe what the Bible says. It doesn't change the fact that I love people, and I was in sin and needed a savior we all did that doesn't mean that people are excluded from finding Christ no it just means that the truth is the truth and we have to say that the truth is the truth and it's still the truth now me talking about sexual immorality makes some of you who are greedy think oh yeah throw rocks at them but you know it's still immoral to love money more than it is to love God Oh, no. What are we to do? Do you see what I'm saying? So you, you take the word of God that you have been given, and so the process happens. You, you put this life is being filtered through us. I know the word. I spend time on the word. I read the word. I let the word have its work within me. It changes me over time because the word has power to do that. And as it does, it changes my attitudes about some things. Because then I have to say, no, that's just, that's just not what the word says. I love people, but if you do that, the wages of that is going to be spiritual death. So you say, well, 
you know, culturally speaking, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's expensive right now, and we're not married, but we're going to live together. It, listen, the wages of sin is going to still be death. It's not going to benefit your finances to sin in another way. It doesn't work that way. And you know what? I know that there have been people who come to this. You know, when people come into church, a lot of people come from all different backgrounds. You may have never heard that that was a problem in your life. And that's okay. That doesn't mean you're kicked out of church. It just means that, hey, there's a way that's better and God has a higher plan for you and his way is going to be better for your life. Because his way isn't death. His way is life, and life more abundant. And so when you get there, you can see, okay, yeah, it may make sense to the world for me to do that, but it's going to make me not close to God anymore. It's going to put separation between us. And then it's going to change how our relationship is moving forward because we're, we're allowing something of the world to come between us. And God said, what I have drawn together, let no man separate. And if you allow that sin to be separating you, then you need to repent so that you can be joined together as God said. Some people say that they don't need to be married in holy matrimony. The difference is authority. By the authority vested in the person before God. So even when you go to a justice of the peace, you're going to somebody who has authority in the municipality to marry you in the eyes of the place that you're living so there's, a, there's an important part about that because when you say, no, we're married together, we just said the words ourselves, but see, there's no authority on the top of what you just did, and nobody knows it, and you haven't done it. It's not a public profession. What baptism is going to be is a public profession. It's a separating from your old life to the new life. And so there's no separation. There's no coming under an authority, and so you say something about what you're doing, but then nobody is going to hold you accountable but the thing is, when you are married in holy matrimony, in Christian marriage, you're accountable to God for that covenant relationship that you've just agreed to. So when you want to quit because it gets hard, you say, no, I made a vow before God. And the authority that God has blessed that union with is also you're under the covering of God. And so you see how, how this works. You see this flow that you get into and as you're, they're shaking and there's water that's washing you, the washing of the word and these things are taking place as the process of becoming more like Christ, your ideas are going to change. And you know, sometimes you get all the way to the end process and your idea about how to worship doesn't agree with somebody else's idea about how to worship. And Paul addressed that in Romans 12 where he said there's some people who can't eat meat sacrificed to idols. But it's not your maturity is an excuse for you to not love your brother. Some people have to worship on the same on a certain day. I don't. It's not something that I'm convicted about, but I'm not going to come between their relationship with God if it is something for them. So when you come into this place of love, the beginning is the sin that needs to be removed. It needs to be removed from us. But then what you're coming to, the gold, is the will of God, the understanding of his will for your life. The process is taking place as you're washed by the word and transformed into the image of Christ Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is taking place. And so when Jesus told the Pharisees that they needed to learn mercy, what he's telling them is that you need to know who you represent. Because you're misrepresenting me when you don't speak what I speak. When you don't have compassion for the people who, need to, who are sick and need a Savior. When you don't show love where people need love. They weren't loving. They had the letter of the law, but not the spirit of it. And he's telling them, you need to learn what I care about because I, I desire mercy. 
more than sacrifice. I want them to know me. And so what ends up happening sometimes, though, is like I spoke about this. You can consider yourself a Christian, but then the act of Christianity needs to be manifest within you. The being a Christian, it needs to be evident to the world that you live in. I know him. How do they know that I know him? Because I'm loving and I'm kind and I have the fruit of the spirit within me. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, meekness, gentleness, self-control. It's part of me. Then as I'm in the world, I can speak about the grace of God because I've experienced the grace of God. So I'm not throwing rocks at people that are living in sin, but I am telling them the good news of the gospel that has the power to transform their life. See the difference? If you're just throwing rocks, who's going to come to that? I'm not walking towards you if every time I walk towards you I get hit in the head with a rock. That wouldn't even be your fault. That would be my fault. The kindness of God leads men to repentance. How do they know the kindness of God? Because they see somebody who knows God and represents him. See, it didn't change the nature of sin, but it expresses the nature of the Savior who sat at the table with the tax collectors and the sinners who were drawn because Matthew's life had changed. And then they get to be in the presence of the Messiah and be changed. This is our life. Welcome to the mission. But I want you to work your way through that list. Yeah, I definitely want you to be able to say that you're a Christian. But I also want you to be able to say that you know him. That you know Jesus. That you've made him Lord of your life. Meaning that you've surrendered your will to him. And you are walking in his will for your life now. You are open to hearing what he wants you to do with the life that you've been given. That's lordship. It's like coming under authority. That's what that means. He's boss. I'm not living by this part anymore. I'm living by the spirit of God within me that gets to lead My spirit has been made alive in Christ Jesus when I believe. And from that place of life, then I can walk according to the spirit. I can see people by the spirit, not by the flesh. I can minister as Jesus would minister from the heart of the Father. And listen, being a follower of Jesus is worth the effort. You know, I I understand how people say, (laughs) you can see how in Christianity people have kind of gotten to this attitude of, if if you tell them that up front, will they they listen? (laughs) Wait, I have to deny myself and follow you and come under your discipline to be your disciple. See, what it's not counting is that When I tell you the truth right now, as I've been telling you the truth this morning, the Holy Spirit bears witness to the word that I'm telling you. And the word of God that you have before you, when you read that word, he'll bear witness to that as well. And so you could say, how would anybody ever come to Jesus? And I'd say, well, I did. And a lot of people in here did, right? And he is absolutely worth the effort of knowing him. And he is, it is an honor to make him known to the world. And if it means that I decrease so that he increases, so be it, because he is perfect. And he's perfect in his love. And he's been so good to me that how can I not? How can I not be who he's called me to be and made me to be and loved me to be? You know, the whole thing is based on love. And that's what Jesus was telling the Pharisees. 
He wasn't telling them to go find stones to stone the tax collectors with. He was telling them to go repent for their hearts. And Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wishes to follow me as my disciple, he must deny himself, set set aside selfish interests, take up his cross, expressing a willingness to endure whatever may come, and follow me, believing in me and conforming to my example in living, and if need be, suffering, or perhaps dying because of the faith in me. Wow. Wow. It's not a light thing. That's why you need to spend the time with him to come to this knowledge, to see where you are and to see what he is calling you to. And that's why I believe that we as a body are being called to maturity and that that opportunity now is made available to us to step into being those that he can trust with his word for those in darkness who need to hear it and that we would represent him well. And in that place of maturity, yeah, there's going to be some stuff that needs to fall off of us. There's going to be sin that tries to entangle us. And when we, when we recognize it for what it is, we get set free by the Spirit when we repent because he wants to refresh you. And he will. But I pray now in Jesus' name that we would be open to the Spirit to minister to us where we are, to show us where what we believe is different from what we say we believe, and that you would bring us into unity with your word, that you would bring us into agreement with your word, Lord, in Jesus' name. And we make ourselves open and available to you, Jesus, right now. We say, have your way in me. Teach me your ways, God. Lead me by your Holy Spirit. I desire to be your disciple. I will follow you, Jesus. And I know this, the day in which you've called me to live is serious, and I do not take lightly this responsibility to represent you well. But I can only do that by the Spirit. And I, I acknowledge that I am empowered by the Holy Spirit. Some of you need to come to Jesus for the first time. And you know it. And you know right now that the day has come for you to make a decision that you have to decide to repent and turn to God. And if that's you, I want you to pray with me right now. Jesus, I need you. I believe that you died on the cross for me. And I believe that you rose again. Jesus, I repent. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins. Help me to forgive those who have sinned against me. Jesus, make me new. Teach me how to live your way. Because from this day forward, Jesus, you are my Lord. 